Hello everyone and welcome to Jumperman Tech where we specialize in HVAC but do everything DIY and in today's training video we're going to go over how to wire the Renko electronic temperature controller. Thank you to everyone tuning in to Jumperman Tech. In today's video we're going to go over how to wire a Renko electronic temperature control and go into a deep dive on it. We're gonna go over some diagrams and I'm gonna physically show you how to wire this control. Specifically, this is the model number ETC-111000-0001. Pretty confusing and long model number, but it is what it is. This is a single stage 120 volt AC or 208 slash 240 volts AC, single pole double throw relay. We're using software version number three for this updated control. Here's a close-up view of the Renko electronic temperature control. As you can see, we have an LCD display and we have three buttons, a set button, an up arrow, and a down arrow. This is used to program the controller. If you're interested in how to program this control, it is my previous video and I will leave a link in this video's description and you will see a pop-up at any moment. To access the wire in this control, you will see four screws. You just simply loosen those up and take off the faceplate. Here's a peek on the inside as I find it extremely helpful to get a visual of what we're looking at before we go into the deep dive on the wiring diagrams. Inside here is where we're going to be doing the actual wiring. Here's a close up at our terminals. And if you can see, we have six of them, three up top, three on the bottom. Up top is gonna to be your power supply. On the bottom are gonna be your contacts. I need to tilt this control a little bit at an angle so you guys can read underneath exactly what these terminals stand for. Hopefully you guys can get a better look through this angle. If we read starting from here, this terminal is your common. Your middle terminal is 120 and your left terminal is 240. This is gonna be your power supply. Next, we have our contacts. This terminal on the right is your common. Terminal in the middle is your normally open. Terminal on your left is your normally closed. Let's begin. When you purchase this control, you're gonna get a set of instructions. And here we have a few typical wire diagrams that you might find out in the field. Here's our first typical wire diagram supplied by the manufacturer. Let's take a look at what we're actually looking at here. See over here, this is the control itself. As I showed you physically before, remember we had six terminals. These three are for our power supply, and these three are our contacts. So here's our control, here's our six terminals. This is gonna be a 120 volt power supply, so the power is going to be supplied here. And this here is our 120 volt load. In this case, that's gonna be our condensing unit consisting of our compressor and our condenser. Let's begin with the first step. In my opinion, it's going to be power supply to our control. Here are our power terminals, common 120, 240. In this case, we have a 120 volt supply, so we're gonna be using 120 in common. In a 120 volt supply, we have a hotline, and we have a neutral. Let's supply power to this control. One line here, our hotline, we're gonna go up and connect it to the 120 volt terminal. Our next line, we're gonna connect it to common, which is gonna be our neutral. So neutral and hot. So we have 120 volts now connected to the control and we're done with initial power. If you look closely, we have another line coming off the 120 in this case. So we have a jumper coming in from the power side into common on our contacts. In this case, we're using a normally open contacts. So we're gonna be using NO in common to achieve what we're trying to do here. I typically see these controls used in commercial refrigeration applications, so in this case, let's think of this as a commercial refrigerator. As you can see now, we have 120 volts supplying the common line, 
and we're using using the normally open contacts. So power will go through the hotline, supply our unit, our controller, and then we're gonna have another 120 volts coming through to our common. It's normally open contacts. So if the box temperature is satisfied, there will be no continuity here. So voltage will not be jumping across to feed our load. Let's say at the moment, the box is set to 35 degrees and it's 35 degrees in the box. So everything is satisfied. These contacts will be open. Let's say temperature rises in the box and we need cooling. These contacts will now close. So power will jump. The 120 volts will power from common, jump into the normally open contact and then flow into our condensing unit. Let's just use this as our compressor. This compressor will now get 120 volts and then it will complete the circuit back to neutral. So now your compressor is running, your condenser fan, if there is one, if it's air cooled, could be water cooled. There's many applications here, but now we are sending voltage to our compressor because we want cooling. And this is how we complete the circuit. With the example that I gave, everything is using the same power supply we're going to use the same diagram but I'm going to give you a different application instead of this being the compressor this 120 volt load can be a solenoid valve so same style everything is wired exactly the same except it's not going to energize the compressor it is going to energize or de-energize a solenoid valve Many walk-in refrigerators and freezers use this style with a solenoid valve as it is a split system. A lot of times it is pressure that controls these units. So let me give this example now. Let's picture this 120 volt load is going to be a solenoid valve. Let's say the box is not calling for cooling. Let's say we want 35 degrees and it's 35 degrees in there, these contacts are open. So there's no power being passed through. Now, let's say the box warms up and we want cooling. 120 volts will be waiting here at common. These contacts will close, sending the 120 volts to our solenoid valve. Here's one line and then it comes back to neutral to complete the circuit. Now we created a magnetic field for our solenoid valve and the plunger goes up and we're allowing refrigerant to flow through the line. Now with refrigerant flowing through the line, uh, it's going to energize our pressure control and it's gonna let us know, hey, we got pressure, we want cooling, and the system will start back on. By system, I mean the compressor and the condensing unit. So now we're generating cooling. Let's say the box reaches temperature. We reach 35 degrees. Now these contacts are going to open. So now we're no longer sending power through and into our solenoid valve. So our solenoid valve de-energizes. We lose the magnetic field. The plunger closes the flow of refrigerant. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna starve the condensing unit of refrigerant. So now our thermostat, our electronic temperature controller said we no longer need cooling. We killed the flow of power to our solenoid valve. And now we're gonna starve with the pressure. That pressure drop is going to open the contacts in our pressure control and say, hey, we're not safe, we're no good, we no longer need cooling, and the pr pressure control is actually gonna turn off the compressor. Pretty interesting. Here's our next wiring diagram. In this case, we're gonna be using 208 volts or 240 volts for a supply and load. Pretty much, it is the exact same thing, except the terminals you use for your power supply. So let's follow this. For 240 or 208 volts, we have two lines 
of 120 volts. So if you measure across here, we're going to have 208 or 240. But if you measure from one line to ground, you're going to get 120 volts on each leg to ground. So instead of using the 120, we're going to use the 240 terminal and the common. So one line comes in into our 240 terminal and then the other line comes in to our common terminal. So now we're feeding the control 208 or 240 volts. It is rated for both. And we follow the same exact process with our common and normally open contacts. As you can see, we're also jumping over power to our common. Here's our next example. And in this one, we're going to have either a 240 volt power supply or a 120 volt power supply. Same thing for this one. 240 volt or 120 volt power supply for a load. Difference in this one, there are no jumpers. So there's going to be two separate power sources. One for this control and most likely our evaporator section. And another power supply separate for our condensing unit. Typically what you would see in this case is either a 240 or 120 volt power supply supplying our evaporator fans which is always getting power and so will our control it will always get power either 120 or 240. In this case you can see it's going to be the same thing we have two wires either in 120 or 240. So let's say with the common here, the common would either go to your neutral or one leg of your 240. And the other line will either be your hot line for your 120 and go to our 120 volt terminal, or it's gonna go to the 240 volt terminal if it's a 240 volt circuit. Pretty self-explanatory there. Next, you can see we're going to have a separate power supply for our contacts. And most likely, this is going to be energizing our compressor or condensing unit through that power supply. So your fans are constantly getting 120 or 240. And your controller for its LCD display is constantly getting 120 or 240. When it comes to the contacts, let's say we are satisfied of course this is going to be normally open so no power is going to be passing through if we call for cooling power will then come from common travel out of normally open these contacts will close so then it will send power and energize our compressor we've gone over the basic applications for this control and typically for any refrigeration thermostat you're going to be using the normally open contacts as you see here, this is a single pole double throw. So when you call for cooling, these normally open contacts will close and these normally closed contacts will open. So there are cases where you would have a wire connected to your normally closed and that is going to be depending on your application. Depending on your application, you may or may not use your normally closed contacts as this control is pretty much universal in heating or cooling equipment. If we read here under applications, it states with its wide temperature set point range and selectable heating or cooling modes, the ETC, which is the model number, can be used for a wide variety of applications, including refrigerated display cases, walk-in and reach-in refrigerators, milk coolers, refrigerated warehouses, chillers, beer and beverage coolers, tank heating, space and return air temperature controls, and condenser fan cycling. Here's just a quick look at the specs that this control can handle, but pretty much your normally open contacts is all you're going to use on a typical refrigeration application. And that's typically where these are used as far as what I see and I use them for. They do make a variety of these controls, as in this case, we have a 208 volt slash 240 volt AC power supply or a 120 volt AC power supply. But in other cases, they do have a 24 volt AC power supply and also a analog output with a zero to 10 volt DC power supply. 
If you guys were wondering what this wire was sticking out of this control, this is actually our wired sensor and it is pre-wired and built into the control, which is a great feature. Another great feature that this control comes with is that it has a locking feature. Right now, as you can see, we have a switch here and it is in the unlock mode. If you don't want anybody messing around in there, changing temperatures or programs, just simply flick that switch. Now your control is locked. And I personally think that's a great, great thing. It definitely gets confusing when you see a bunch of wires, but right now I'm going to show you what the wires on the control actually look like. So right now we're going to connect the power supply with a 120 volt power supply. This is what it will look like with a 120 volt power supply. We're using our common and 120 volt port. If you are using a 208 volt or 240 volt power supply, you would use this terminal here labeled as 240 and common. Here you can see this is an example of a 240 volt power supply using our normally open contacts, which is normally open in common. That was basically this wiring diagram here where we have separate power sources. We're going to have either a 120 or 240 volt power supply and a separate power source for our contacts. Next I'm going to show you the representation of this diagram here where we have a 208 or 240 volt power supply. Right, We're using this and this terminal for a power supply and our load is also 208 or 240 volts. So the first line is going to come in to the 240 and then jump across. And remember, each leg to ground is 120, so 120 is going to enter to here once the contacts close when we call for cooling or heating. And then the other side of this piece here, which could be a solenoid valve, and this is a coil. The other end is going to come back to this side, and between these two, we have 208. But I'm going to show you a physical representation of what that would look like. Here's what that would look like. One leg of our 240, 208 is here. And then the other leg of the 240 is this blue wire. And so you can see here the orange wire is jumped over into the common. Then we have one side of common coming out red. And then one line of normally open with the yellow. The next diagram I'm going to show you a physical representation of is the one with the 120 volt power source and the 120 volt load. Pretty much the only difference is that we're going to enter through the 120 line, not the 240, and we're going to jump over from that line to common instead of the 240. And there you have it. We have the white wire on common and now our blue wire on 120. These two are going to be our power source. Then we're going to jump over with orange from the 120 into our common where we have the red coming into common and then our normally open contact using yellow. Once the control is wired you can power it up and program it. That was my previous video. Definitely check that out. Highly recommend it. And in my next video I'm going to do an in-depth troubleshooting video on exactly how to check this control once you stumble onto it in the field. We're going to be checking voltages and all that. For now, we're going to wrap this one up. And if anyone found this video interesting or helpful, please drop a like, comment, and subscribe as I come out with new videos every week. And I'll catch you all next time.